on behalf of the Forge, I greet and salute every one of you and extend a very warm welcome to our panelist, the presenter, Advocate Tembala Ngoi Tobi. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you, Advocate, for accepting our invitation and for always supporting our work. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. Our sincere greetings and appreciation go to our discussant for the evening, Professor Gordon Zide, Prof. Nkostapun. Thank you, Prof, for accepting our invitation. This evening's program will be facilitated by our comrade, Dr. Vashna Jagannath. Comrade Vashna will be driving this session. Thank you, comrade. We are looking forward to, to the whole session. Briefly about, uh, okay, before I, I go to the bios of our, of our comrades, I just want to also acknowledge the presence here with us of the SG of Monsa, the comrade Jim. <laughs> Briefly about our panelist, Advocate Tendela Mwaitobi has written about the history of the black intellectual thought and, cons and constitutional thought and all matters related to land, having ordered the best selling The Land is Ours, published in 2018, and Land Matters, published in 2021. He is interested in the life of Robert Mangai Sosokowe, focusing on Sosokowe's impact on apartheid legal system, on the apartheid legal system, and in turn, the impact of this system on the cause of Sosokowe's own life. Can we give one to the time? <laughs> and Uprof, Uprof Gordon Dodong Zizide is the chairperson of the Robert Mangai Sosokowe Trust and Professor Emeritus in Anthropology at the University of South Africa, UNISA. He is the former Vice Chancellor of Val University of Technology and is one of the co-authors of the recently published South African Leaders' Challenges since 1994, a book that was launched recently at UNISA about two weeks ago. A round of applause for the book. <laughs> Uto Sabashna Jagannath is a scholar activist and is the director of Pen Africa Today. She works in the office of the General Secretary of NUMSA. She is also Deputy General Secretary of the Social Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party and Senior Researcher and Senior Research Associate at the Center for Social Change at the University of Johannesburg. <laughs> and briefly about the Forge. The Forge is a space for progressive culture and thinking together from Pan-African, socialist, feminist, and other progressive perspectives. We work closely with a, a wide range of left organizations, including community groups, social movements, and trade unions. And now we invite you all to enjoy this, evening, this evening's event, an exploration, an exploration of the interface of the life of Robert Magaliso Sobowe and the upper technical system. and kick off with such an exciting program and the 45th anniversary of the death of Robert Subukwe. And I think in a time like this, in our country where we often are in darkness and feel lost and we have very few solutions, um, it's wonderful to remember, not just for the sake of remembering or for nostalgia, but to engage in a very real way with experiences from the past, with lessons from the past and with alternatives that we don't have to accept the status quo. That even under the most extreme difficult circumstances, people arise to take up the challenge to liberate us. And I think that today will be such a moment for us to think through a life of someone who did that. And um, I'd like to ask 
I mean, I know it's not fashionable anymore to say the word comrade, apparently. That's why we have no electricity. Uh, comrade and Lenin and Marx are the reason why we have no electricity anymore. Uh, but I'll say, still say, comrade, say, my guy, could you please uh, go forward then? Uh, thank you for the invitation. Tonight's lecture is entitled The Legality of Evil, Robert Sobukwe and the Apartheid Legal Order. I will speak about Robert Sobukwe and the Apartheid Legal Order, not his politics. There is enough material on that topic. I do not claim to exhaust the subjects of Sobukwe's place within the Apartheid Legal Order. I promise only to make some explanatory themes which are missing from today's recollection of Sobukwe's life. Even that promise, my promise, may turn out to be extravagant. Indeed, more illustrious writers have written about Sobukwe, his life, his beliefs, and his legacy. Mine is a limited part of his life, but it is important because it shaped who he became, and he in turn shaped the system of the apartheid legal order, exposing its excesses, immoralities, and depravities. We owe at least one provision in our Bill of Rights to Sobukwe, namely Section 36 of the Constitution, which requires that any law passed for the purpose of limiting the rights in the Bill of Rights should first and foremost be of general application. The immorality of the apartheid legal order was exposed by its desire to create a law for one man, Sobukwe. I am running ahead of myself, so let me start at the beginning. On 23 March 1960, Sobukwe and 22 other accused were charged before the magistrate's court in the district of Johannesburg with two charges. Acting in breach of Section 2A of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1953, Section 2 of that law made it a criminal offense to advise, encourage, incite, command, aid, or procure any other person or persons in general to commit any offense by way of protest against a law or in support of any campaign against any law. In effect, it was an offense to campaign for the change of the law. This amendment was the response by the apartheid government to the defiance campaign of 1952. At this campaign, there was agitation spearheaded by the ANC for the repeal of the past laws. A person found guilty under Section 2 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act could be imprisoned for a maximum period of five years. They could also be whipped for ten strokes. The charge sheet listed a second offence. Sobuka was also guilty, it was said, of violating Section 15 of Act No. 67 of 1952. The title of that law was called Natives, Abolition of Passes and Coordination of Documents. Its purpose was to provide for the issue of reference book, books to natives, and those were the passes. At the time he was charged, Sobuke was without any formal employment. He had resigned his position as an assistant in Bantu languages at Vitz University on the 20th of March 1960, finding it impossible to balance the competing demands on his time. He had decided to devote his time to the liberation of African people from apartheid. He was the president and founder of the Pan-Africanist Congress. In 1966, at the initiative of Peter Raboroko, the PAC added the term Azania to its repertoire of struggle. It would from that moment be called the PAC of Azania. The case against Sobukwe did not proceed on the 23rd of March, 1960 the prosecutor asked for a postponement. When the accused appeared on the 26th of March, Sobuke applied for permission to attend the funeral of those killed at Sharpville on the 21st of March, 1960, which was in Ferienache. This was permitted. The trial eventually started on the 4th of April, 1960. On that day, the names of Robert Sobuke, Potlako Nebalo, Selbing and Dan, Lennox Mlonzi, Rosette Nziba, Jacob Nyause, Zephania Mutoper, John Walaza, Daniel Kuno, Wellington Randaka, John Machete, Raphael Chabalana, John Nengwana, Josias Mazunya, Solomon Matopa, Zakaria Mtunzi, 
Abraham Bukhale, Abe Bukhale, James Tamaye, Johannes Pasha, Lucas Matlow, George Ndovu, Joshua Bahabe, George Sewisa, and Lancelot Mahoti were called in as I choose to number one to number 23. I have decided to recall their names because in the official records, they are simply referred to as the others. Sabuqa's relationship with the law was that of an accused, no longer its chief defier as he had been in March 1960. The charges were, not, were for not carrying their own passes on the 21st of March, and as their ringleaders for inciting others to defy the pass laws. Almost immediately after the trial had commenced, Sobuka took charge. Standing up, he announced the intention of the accused. I quote, Your Worship, without impugning your personal integrity and honor, we refuse to plead, because our contention is that the law under which we are charged is a law made exclusively by the white men, specifically for the oppression and suppression of blacks, and the officers who administer that law are themselves white. And in this whole drama, only the accused are black, and we don't feel that justice can be done under those circumstances, and we therefore refuse to plead. The magistrate, Mr. J.K. Duplessis, cut him short, asking him, are you now speaking on behalf of all of the accused when you say you refuse to plead? Sobuka replied, I refuse to plead, Your Worship. The magistrate decided to put an end to the exchange. Well, in that case, the court must enter a plea of not guilty to both the main and alternative charges by all accused. Do you understand? Sobuka responded, I understand, Your Worship. The first witness was Daniel Machuta, called by the state described in the court records as a Bantu detective constable attached to the security branch stationed in Johannesburg. He had attended meetings of the PAC, taken notes of those meetings, and effectively spied on behalf of the government. And so was the second witness, Solomon Mdunga, another Bantu constable in the South African police attached to this security staff. His duties also included attending the meetings of the PAC, taking verbatim notes, and reporting to the white government. And so again was a third constable. It turned out that in all of the meetings of 1959 and 1960, the PAC had been infiltrated. The accused had not appointed a lawyer. Their approach, underpinned by the slogan, no bail, no defense, no fine, was to surrender themselves for arrest. They believed they could collapse the entire pass law system by filling the prisons with pass law accused. As the person leading the defense, Sobuka would ask the questions to each of the state witnesses before the other accused asked their own. Sobuka did, in a form of cross-examination, pose those questions, but with very limited success and effectiveness. For the evidence of the accused, Sobuka made a statement from the dock until this moment in history, no other political trialist had ever used a statement from the dock, which effectively amounts to turning the tables on the prosecutors, making the state to defend apartheid rather than the accused to explain their conduct. So we could remind the magistrate, the court, Your Worship, you will remember that when the case began, we refused to plead because we felt no moral obligation whatsoever to obey the laws which are made by the whites and are administered for the whites, for an unjust law cannot be applied justly. We believe in one race, he said, only the human race to which we all belong. The history of the human race is a long history of struggle against all restrictions, physical, mental, and spiritual. And we would have betrayed the human race if we had not done our share. The magistrate was stunned, but he could not interrupt Sobuko. He was in his stride. Briefly put, Your Worship, he continued, our organization, the PAC, aims at the complete overthrow of, the white, of white domination. It was the prosecutor feeling a little bit of pressure from the sheer power of the words. He would object, Your Worship, the accused should not read from the notes that he had prepared. 
Yet Sohuko's response was reflective of his general calm demeanor throughout the trial. Even in the ultimate theater of the apartheid legal system, the court, he would retain his thoughtfulness and morality in his position. Your worship, he continued, I shall put the notes aside if that is the feeling of the crown. Then he proceeded to repeat myself, our organization aims at the overthrow of white domination and the establishment of a non-racial democracy in South Africa. It is the PAC's historical role, he continued, to contribute to the establishment of the United States of Africa. In the language of the movement, the United States of Africa will stretch from Cape to Cairo, from Morocco to Madagascar. The PAC, he pressed, represents thinking on a continental level. They stand for a government of Africans, by Africans, for the Africans, with everybody who owes his allegiance to the continent of Africa and is prepared to accept the democratic rule of an African majority being regarded as an African. So we were prepared to answer the questions from the prosecutor. The first question was, you told us in your evidence that on 8 November 1958, you seceded from the ANC. Why did you secede from this organization? Sobeko was forthright, he would not be intimidated. The reason for the secession, he noted, was because of the adoption of the Freedom Charter, which stood for multiracialism, which the PAC condemns, because it implies transfer of the prejudices and the bigotry that applies in the present society to a new society. And in effect, that means racism multiplied. From the PAC's standpoint, the land belongs to all African people, not on the basis of slavery and mastership or dispossessor and the dispossessed. Is that true? The prosecutor asked rather incredulously. Yes, Sobhoko replied. Who are the slaves that you are referring to? Sobhoko's response was clear. The slaves are the Africans, and the masters are the white people. The two cannot live hand in hand unless the majority rule the land. As this exchange took place, there was silence in the courtroom. The magistrate had reclined to his seat, no longer interjecting. When the judgment came on the 4th of May, it was perhaps unsurprising. The evidence of all of the witnesses of the state was accepted and the evidence from the defense was rejected. In summarizing his conclusion, the magistrate st stated, the only question remaining to be dealt with is whether you incited or encouraged native people to contravene the provisions of the past laws. From his point of view, there was no doubt that this was indeed the case. Such slogan as no bail, no defense, no fine inflamed and aroused the passions of the masses to follow their leaders in the PAC. Only four of the 23 original accused were acquitted. John Malaza, Joshua Machaba, Lancelot Mahosi, Mahoti, and John Machete. Although Matsunya had been expelled from the PAC on the 1st of March 1960, he was ultimately found guilty of the charges. So long perceived by the state as the prime mover behind the Sharpton protest, was sentenced to three years imprisonment. The remaining 18 accused were sentenced to between 18 months and two years in prison. The slogan of the PAC, no bail, no defense, no fine, also meant that there would be no appeal. But in fact, appeals were submitted. While no attorneys were retained for the trial, one was hired for the appeal. Mr. S.S.A. Sikakani, Advocate Jack Unterhalter, represented Sohukwe and the others in the appeal. The appeal was held in the then Transvaal Provincial Division of the Supreme Court and dismissed summarily on the 8th of November, 1960. While the appeal was pending, Sohukwe had in fact began the life of a prisoner shortly after the sentencing. In those days, unlike now perhaps, it was not unusual for a convicted a convicted prisoner to commence their sentence while the appeal process was taking place. With the handing down of the sentence on 4 May 1960, Sobukwe's relationship with the apartheid legal system was again transformed from accused to convict and prisoner. He was taken to the Johannesburg prison, notorious for the incarceration of political detainees, 
known as number four, the fort. Today we know this to be the place which houses our constitutional here. How would the system treat him now that he was no longer agitator, he was no longer an accused, but he was a prisoner? At the fort, the harshness, the brutality, the hostility began all over again. Although his jailers had no control over his ideas, they had total control over his body. He would exchange his clothes for prison uniform, which were a pair of short pants, a khaki shirt, and a jersey. No shoes. Later on, sandals without socks were given to him. They also shaved his head. And no, they wouldn't touch him. In fact, they asked another prisoner to do so. And that prisoner used a razor blade with a little water and soap, and often leaving the scraped head with cuts and bleeding. They must have enjoyed the cruel spectacle. Finally, they were able to insult him, to spit on him, and to show him that they are his boss. Although the fort incarcerated political prisoners, they were common criminals too. In their company, Sobu could find himself in an unfamiliar place, in a bit of a wilderness. He would be at the receiving end of their maltreatment, no doubt eager to please the white prison authorities. He noted that one of his responsibilities was administering political education to the criminal prisoners that he found at the fort. In fact, one prisoner would later recall the power of the prof's teachings in being proud of who you are and how this helped him after his release from prison to reform himself from the life of criminality and banditry into a responsible father for his family and his children. So who has served the balance of his sentence at the Pretoria Central Prison? Their paths crossed once again with Nelson Mandela, who was serving a five-year sentence. They apparently shared a cell. Sobuka was due to be released from Pretoria Central on 3 May 1963, having completed the three-year sentence. But this did not happen. Instead, on the 1st of May 1963, an extraordinary thing happened. The Minister of Justice, Hubert Pelser, the Prime Minister, Hendrik Fervut, and Charles Swart, the state president, all played a role in piloting a new law, which was published in the Extraordinary Government Gazette of the 2nd of May 1963, to amend the Suppression of Communism Act. The core of that law was contained in Section 4, which was a long section, but its effect was clear. The Minister of Justice at the time B.J. Forster had the power to extend the sentence of any prisoner falling into identified categories, including political prisoners, notwithstanding the sentence imposed by a court. Although the law purported to be general in its scope of application, it was known that, in fact, its object was the continued incarceration of Sobuka. Hence, Section 4 was referred to as the Sobuka Clause. The law, in fact, confirmed Sobuka's standing as a political prisoner. And by this I mean a prisoner who was in prison, not because the court had pronounced him guilty of a crime, but because the political establishment had considered him a political risk. Sobuka was in prison on the instruction of a politician, the Minister of Justice, not on the instruction of a judge. There was widespread condemnation of the law. The Spectator of London labeled the law simply as barbarism, stating that it is difficult to imagine a more refined form of torture than to wait until a man is within days of completing a long prison sentence and then to announce that he is not going to be released after all, but will be kept in jail indefinitely. On the 1st of May 1963, indeed, B.J. Forster announced that the cabinet had decided that Robert Mamadis Osobu, whose prison sentence expires on 3 May 1963, will be detained under the Suppression of Communism <coughs> Act of 1950, as amended by the General Law Amendment Bill, which has just been passed in Parliament. Something extraordinary had happened. The law had been passed within 10 days after it was initially piloted. Sobuka, however, was no longer in Pretoria. 
He had been secretly taken to Robben Island. A. B. Ngobu, an executive member of the PAC, told Sobukwe's biographer, Benjamin Pogrum, that Sobukwe's intention was to organize for the PAC as soon as he was let out of prison. But he had the premonition that something was afoot and that he would not be allowed out of prison. This indeed came to pass as on the 23rd of April 1963, he was secretly spirited out of Pretoria to Robben Island. No announcements were made until Foster's public statement, which confirmed the continued imprisonment of Sobukwe. Despite being a prisoner, prison officials still felt the need to expand their control over Sobukwe's activities. In December 1963, a visit from Ernest Sobukwe, his elder brother, who was also a reverend, was permitted by the prison authorities. Yet in January 1964, two visits from Benjamin Pogrund were denied. And so was the request of an interview by Mr. M.T. Murani of the World Newspaper. As a prisoner, the state's attitude towards Sobukwe remained ambivalent. For example, in one month, Benjamin Pogrun was granted two visitation privileges on the 3rd and 21st of April 1964. In that visit, Pogrun learned that the prison authorities had censored subscriptions which were arranged for Sobukwe in respect of the London newspaper known as the Observer. But there was denial from the prison authorities. While they were willing to grant Mr. Pogrun visitation rights, the prison authorities at first inexplicably refused the same privileges to his wife, to, so to Sobukwe's wife, Veronica, or as Sobukwe himself called it, Zodo. A letter of 3 June 1964 from Veronica makes an application to visit their husband but it was turned down with no reason other than the short reply, the minister is not prepared to grant your request. That also meant that Sobukwe's children could not visit him in prison. The attitude is also evident in the approach of the authorities to other visits. Father Flexmo, a priest, had applied to visit Sobukwe on the 14th of June 1964 for religious reasons. First, it was indicated that there would be no objection but then, when the police objected, the magistrate also declined the visit. And yet, Reverend Story was allowed a visit. Despite Mrs. Sobukwe having been told that her visit would be denied, a month later, in July 1964, it would be granted, but only on one condition, <coughs> that she would visit her husband thrice weekly during a period of 28 days, as from the 23rd of July, 1964. No explanation was forthcoming why the visit had first been declined, and why it was granted, and why the conditions were imposed. Sobukwe had no control over his physical health either. This was under the control of the magistrates. When the district surgeon, Dr. Van Bergen, arranged a visit by a dentist, the magistrate was furious writing to the Secretary of Justice, reprimanding him for allowing a dentist to visit a prisoner. The Department of Justice would later relent, ultimately agreeing that visits, including by doctors, could only be authorized at the instance of magistrates. What this meant was that it was not the opinion of doctors about Sobukwe's life, that Sobukwe's health that mattered, but the police and the magistrates. The security police could overrule the doctors as to the desirability of a specialist physician or a dentist visiting Sobukwe. <coughs> By December 1964, Veronica had learned the ways of the Robben Island system. Her visits to her husband during that period experienced less hassles than the July visits. But she was still warned that her visits should be limited to three times a week for one month a year. Earlier correspondence shows that the police considered instructing her that she could also not sleep at Robben Island because there were no such facilities. Apparently there were no beds there. <laughs> but it appears that this was later revoked. Sobukwe, it must be recalled, was not an ordinary prisoner. He had a separate prison facility where he was kept alone. His company were the prison guard and the prison dogs that often barked menacingly and incessantly. 
So Bubba had also learned about another law, the law of the prison. There was the written law of the country, and even for an apartheid legal system, whose laws by definition were obnoxious, certain fundamental protections were afforded to prisoners. But there were also other laws, and these were the laws that were practiced inside the prison. And these laws could be taken arbitrarily, others could be broken arbitrarily at the discretion of the officials and their magistrates. An isolated prisoner, far, far from the media, legal institutions, parliamentary inquiries, is no match for a prison system. The system was also fighting a total war. By denying him reading material, the prison guards could diminish his intellectual faculties. By arbitrarily curtailing visitation rights by his wife, they could damage his emotional well-being. In controlling access to physicians and dentists, the authorities could debilitate his physical well-being. And by restricting the visits of the priests, the prison authorities could destroy his spirit. These were the laws of the prison, often operating in unofficial, yet insidious and distress, distressing and damaging ways. Sobukwa's story was by now no longer only a matter of law. It had also become a matter of politics. Politicians in opposition to the government began calling for his release. Mrs. Helen Sussman, Sussman was elected to the House of Assembly under the ticket of the United Party, representing the constituency of Houghton in Johannesburg. Because the United Party, uh, of the United Party's support for the Separate Amenities Act of 1953, designed to enforce petty apartheid, Mrs. Sussman resigned from the United Party. She then established the Progressive Party, which espoused liberal ideals. By 1964, Mrs. Sussman was still a member of parliament. She had taken keen interest in the imprisonment of Sobukwe and began a campaign in parliament to call for his release. But unlike Sobukwe's earlier encounters with the law, inside a court and in prison, Sussman's campaigns sought to engage a different legal institution within the apartheid architecture, namely parliament. If the executive unfairly suppressed Sobukwe and the judiciary had shown little interest in intervention, could Parliament perhaps open a new avenue to champion the rights and the possible release of Sobukwe? On the 7th of, July, of February 1964, Mrs. Sussman began her campaign. The question which she posed in Parliament pertained to the difficult subject for Sobukwe, one that had caused him much anxiety and reflection. Mrs. Sussman asked the Minister of Justice whether the person detained on Robben Island in terms of Section 4 of the General Law Amendment Act 1963 had applied for an exit permit for himself and his family, and if so, whether the application had been granted. You see, an exit permit was a one-way ticket out of South Africa. If granted, it could mean that Sobukwe would lose his rights to the citizen of South Africa. But as it turned out, in that parliamentary exchange of the 7th of February, Sobukwe had in fact applied for an exit permit on the 3rd of January 1964. Whether or not he intended to lose his South African citizenship could be a matter of conjecture. What is clear is that the act of incarceration in the hands of the politicians had rendered his stay intolerant and he was willing to accept an exit permit out of South Africa. In 1965, a fresh campaign began, still driven by Sussman. The focus was the direct confrontation inside of the hallowed chambers of parliament with the Minister of Justice. The campaign had international dimensions too. On the 19th of April 1965, Mr. Abingo, a member of the executive of the PAC in Elza, delivered a standing address at the United Nations General Assembly to the Special Committee on the Policies of Apartheid. There, he referred to Sobukwe as the national leader of our people confined to Robben Island under Clause 4 of the General Law Amendment Act. Novo brought the, hy the hypocrisy of the apartheid legal system to the fore. It was the police he charged who had opened fire at unarmed people in Sharpville and London, where they brutally massacred African people. Yet, the police were not on trial. It was Sobukwe 
the leader of the dead, that was the only man who had been held and imprisoned without trial under the Sobuka clause. And that imprisonment, the Minister of Justice had pronounced, would last until this side of eternity. Mr. Chairman said, Mr. Noble concluded, my petition is that this man must be set free. Although the speech received universal acclaim, at home, the National Party remained unmoved. On the 3rd of June, 1965, Mrs. Suzman had astonished the National Party in government when she directly challenged them on the imprisonment of the woman. Until then, the generally held view within the white conservative population was that the government was taking necessary steps to curb the possible spread of communism and the spread of revolution which threatened white interests. So uh, Suzman began by attacking the apartheid law which entitled the police to hold people for extended periods of time in detention without trial. One person, for instance, had been held for 19 months without trial, another for 18, and Stanley Mabizela of East London for 17 months. Nine men had been held for 10 months without a trial. And yet the government's position was always that if you are innocent, you have nothing to fear. But for Susman, this was unacceptable, as no one should be kept in prison, just in case they may be guilty. And even when the courts had acquitted them, the police had the strategy of simply rearresting anyone that they deemed to be a threat to their interests. Then Susman shifted attention to her campaign for the release of Sobuka. By then, Sobuka was in his third year of imprisonment. He had now doubled the original penalty of three years. Susman explained that her disagreements with Sobuka's political views did not mean that Sobuka could be kept in prison indefinitely. Let me quote from her. It is true that he was the head of the PAC, speaking about Sobu, with whose political views, aims, and objects I disagree entirely. But when the major trouble arose, the Poco and other troubles which were identified with the PAC, Sobu was already in jail. And I presume that if a man is on Robben Island, he cannot cook up Poco, and therefore he can in no way be held responsible for the Poco attacks. Suzman's simple plea, simple plea, as she put it, was that no man should be held after he has served his sentence for the crime of which he was duly convicted unless he commits another crime again. He demanded the minister to explain why Sobuka was still in detention. There was no reply from the government's benches. Only Suzman was accused as being a mouthpiece of communists and agitators. The government also mumbled something about recidivism, that the law was necessary to stop people from reoffending. And, as they stated, in their belief, the minister would not typically abuse his powers. So if a person had been denied release from incarceration under the law, it was most likely because they did not deserve to be released. The government would simply not budge on Sobukwa's release. Sussman's questions and Noble's speech in the United Nations served only to increase the cause for Sobukwa's release domestically and internationally. One of the impacts of those speeches was a panic within the National Party establishment, which opened the possibility that some selected journalists could visit Sobukwa. One of those was a journalist from Dibega, which was pleased to publish a report accompanied by a picture of a healthy looking Sobuko in his prison cell standing next to a policeman on the 20th of August 1965. If the intention of Dibega's publication on the 20th of August 1965 had been to portray an image of a fit and healthy Sobuko, it was being undermined by medical science. Dr. Berry Kapla examined Sobukwe on the 20th of October 1965 on the recommendation of the district surgeon and with the consent of the police. He recommended an operation for possible uh, uh, prostate. This could not be done on the island because a fully equipped theater was necessary. Dr. Kaplan recommended that Sobukwe should be transferred to the new Somerset Hospital. But he made it clear that this was urgent. Sobuka also needed a new pair of glasses, 
since he had not changed his glasses since 1956. The operation was not done urgently, even though the visit was in October. So Booker was only seen at Karl Bremer Hospital in January 1966. The, the report of the Star newspaper of the 9th of February 1966. Okay, shall we wait for the kids to... to <laughs> Alright, let's do that. That's a, generally regarded to be a good sign. The Star newspaper of the 9th of February 1966 would report Sobukwe, who is confined on Robben Island, left the Karl Bremer Hospital yesterday after he had been operated on for a prostate gland. Members of the South African police brought him to hospital secretly about 14 days ago and he was registered as a patient under another name his identity was so well guarded that not even the Watts sisters knew that one of South Africa's best known political prisoners was being treated there. Soboka himself did not disclose his identity to the staff. Even in sickness, his name was not meant to be spoken about. The operation did not improve his state of health. Veronica wrote a letter to the authorities on the 5th of March 1966 in which she protested that Sobuka's health had deteriorated. When I saw my husband, she noted in the letter, he was complaining about other aspects of his health. He had developed rheumatism. His eyes and teeth were, give, were giving his trouble. His finger joints were swollen and disfigured. These complaints, which were also echoed by Pogrud, were simply brushed aside by the authorities, merely recorded, recorded that in their view, there was no justification to the complaints. The Minister of Justice sought again for the fourth time to extend the law on the 2nd of February 1966. And despite objections, the law was extended. When the question arose as to why the law was being extended for the fifth, fourth time, the Minister responded, we do not regard Sobukwe as a prisoner we regard him as a detainee. Concessions, he claimed, had been made in respect of the visits from his wife and his children. This was the fourth extension of the law. And yet, there, was, there were more extensions. Minister Persa must have given the game away on the 12th of June, 1968, when he said, if I have to consider the extension, what is in the best interest of the country is what I'm looking for. That one man be detained under favorable circumstances or that the safety of the country be threatened by his being released, that is all that is involved. We can talk here about this matter for days and we shall not make any progress at all. It was in the 1969 debates, after Sobuko had now spent nine years in prison, that the government finally relented. But that was not because, that was not before the now notorious remark of Pelsa. When he was asked why Sobukwe should not simply be placed on house arrest, like the government had done in relation to Chief Albert Lutuli, president of the ANC, the government's reply was the following. Compared to Sobukwe, Lutuli is a lightweight. On the 12th of May, 1969, the Minister of Justice finally withdraw the notices under which Sobukwe had been detained at Robben Island. That set the scene for his eventual release. But even as he left Robben Island, the apartheid legal order refused to let him become a free man. Instead, a fresh notice was issued, this time under Section 9 of the Suppression of Communism Act. He would not be allowed to return to Johannesburg, where he resided at the time of his arrest. He would serve a punishment order in the black township of Khadeshiwe in Kimberley. There would be strict conditions. He would not attend gatherings, whether social, political, or even attend schools at the school assembly. No student could be addressed by him. He could not absent himself from his home at number six Naledi Street, Khadeshiwe, at any time except during the period commencing at six in the morning and ending at six in the afternoon. 
He could not be in a Bantu hostel, Bantu compound, a factory, a newspaper office, or any place of learning. A new chapter was, however, about to begin, despite these restrictions. At Roman Island, Sobuka had completed a degree in economics, in addition to his previous qualifications of BA honors in languages. But now, his banning orders prevented him from teaching, yet the ban contained an exception in respect of court proceedings, where he could appear as a witness or for purposes of doing a case on behalf of an accused person. It was this gap that Sobuka would exploit in the final chapter of his life. This was now the beginning of Sobuka's journey to qualify as an attorney. Sobuka approached an attorney who was practicing in Kimberley, and his name was H.Z.M. Nzimande, who was at Royal Street at the Hanashiwa village. Mr. Nzimande was happy to accept Sobuka as an articulate clerk, provided that the security branch would grant the permission. That was the easy part. Mr. Zimanda would not pay Sobukwe, despite being his clerk. As a university graduate, however, Sobukwe would be required to serve articles for three rather than five years. An offer for lectureship and PhD studies at the University of Wisconsin did not materialize because although an exit permit was granted, the Minister of Justice refused to relax Sobukwe's restrictions to enable him to leave the magisterial district of Kimberley. A court application brought in this connection failed. That, in a sense, enabled Sobuka to commence his articles of clerkship. His banning orders, however, remained. He could not travel out of Khaneshiwa without permission, nor could he receive visitors at home. A letter of 24 September 1973 proves how absurd the situation had become. He wrote to the magistrate of Kimberley, requesting the permission to receive visitors at home other than the visitors specified in the notice. This is what he said. My application is based on the fact that as an article clerk, quite a number of people who find our offices closed over the weekend and or find Mr. Zimande out, attempted to take their problems to me at home. But because of my banning order, I cannot receive them in my house. So because banning order issued upon his release from incarceration, in 1969 and valid for five years, lapsed in 1974. But instead of scrapping it altogether, now that Sobuke was on a new journey to become a lawyer, it was extended by another five years. By February 1975, Sobuke had completed his articles. An application had to be made for the admission, for his admission as an attorney. His Johannesburg correspondent attorney was Desri Mamsi Fima the very first African female attorney in South Africa, admitted in 1969, who was in a partnership with Godfrey Peter, who most of you would remember from the African National Congress Youth League. But as he was still a banned person, a request to vary the terms of his banishment to enable him to practice as an attorney was made. This time, the minister was Jimmy Kruger. He granted the permission surprisingly, on the 20th of March, 1975. And on the 13th of June, 1975, Sobukwe was admitted as an attorney. The judge who admitted Sobukwe as an attorney was Leona van der Heever, herself the very first female judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. Sobukwe did not stay long with Mr. Zimande after his qualification as an attorney. Indeed, by February 1976, he had opened his law firm, R.M. Sobukwe, attorney, practicing at number 24 Tyson Road, Hanashiwa, Kimberley. Sobukwe had now completed the full cycle. The law was once used against him. Now he could also use the law. But it was still a bad law, drawn with racial prejudice and designed for discrimination. He would have to apply it, nevertheless. But mostly, he would have to undertake the moral, spiritual, intellectual, emotional journey to find spaces within a bad law so that he could do justice to his clients. He did not live long after that moment. In 1977, because of his deteriorating health, 
he could no longer fulfill his dream of using the law to help his people. Today, in 1978, sadly, he passed on. The official record shows that he died from prostate cancer. He was 53 years of age when he died. Zodo, his widow, lived to see the dawn of freedom. She died on the 15th of August, 2018, from ill health. Some of Sobukwe's comrades from the trial went on to play prominent roles within the PEC, inside and outside of South Africa, and in exile. Kotla Konibalo, for instance, died in London in 1986. Zefania Mutopeng, fondly remembered as the Lion of Azalia, was in and out of prison. He would later become the president of the PAC, but also died before his beloved Azalia could be liberated. It is impossible, probably imponderable, to speculate tonight about what the prof would have made of today's crisis-ridden South Africa. We can say, however, that he would have put humanity first. So we remember him. He's a yeah. yes. Thank you so much for that. It was really rich and a uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we'll have the response now by Comrade Bosman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, um, colleagues, fellow Africanists. Isolate. Yeah. Isolate. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to thank my senior counsel. <laughs> uh, it is important that we recognize that title, even though we're meeting here as fellow Africans and as fellow Africans. Um, Jola has touched on a number of uh, issues which directly uh, pertain to the father of Pan-Africanism in Azania. And I will not attempt to repeat everything that he has said, but I will basically touch on my own understanding in support of what Jola has said about uh, Robert Mangali Sobukwe. I met him in 1958 and some of you were not born. <laughs> I know for a fact. And uh, how did I meet him? I met him in Alwa North, you know, a, a small town um, almost next to the borders of the Sutro. I see that SG is not him. Not him, it means that he knows Alwa North. Um, he was visiting one of his uh, comrades which was my late uncle, John Yati Pokela. And at the time, I was a, a boy myself, um, not very much clued in the politics. I used to go via my uncle's place. He was teaching in Malcolm Secondary School, uh, teaching history. Now, what really struck me the most about Pox and politics, as they um, affectionately called my uncle, is that he was teaching history, <coughs> And um, there was Reverend Mkutega, who was a Methodist minister. And they would always meet at um, the mission house of Reverend Mkutega. I was friends with uh, the Reverend's children. And we did not understand it. Later dawned on us that Reverend Mkutega himself was an Africanist. But of course, they would meet at the men's under the guise of the Fundisi meeting his fellow congregants, and yet it was a PAC meeting. Um, and then again, um, my uncle introduced, oh, thank you, introduced me, my closer name, as you understood when Losi introduced me, is Ndodomzi. Now, I always say Ndodomzi stands for being a man of the house. Now, what happened is that um, the ladies here, whenever, I visit, you know, the houses where there is no 
man or husband. And I say that I am the don't. <laughs> No, I am the Romsi. I'm head of family here. So that's it. But he said to me, oh, Ubuntu order. And I said, okay, no, that's fine. And I want to say to you, comrades, at that time, it did not mean anything to me, quite honestly. Then in 1976, fast forward, yesterday, I was requested by the late um, Selby Gendane as well as Bujo Wabeni, that um, I should accompany them to Harishima. Now again, I said to myself, but why would these old men choose on me to accompany them? It did not make sense to me, but nonetheless, I said, let us go. It was shortly after he had received, you know, his permission to see, but still not more than one person at a time. So we parked the car at a very strategic position. Um, so it was Bujo who went in first, and he came back, and then he was followed by Butsel Bingendane, and then it was me, and I went in. When I came in, you know, typical him with his pipe, and he said, oh, Lord, you're such a grown up man. I said, oh. The two comrades who came before me may have told him that we got another visitor. Uh, it cannot be that I met him in 1958, he still remembers me in 1958. So I said to him, Tata, it's not possible. Um, how come you remember me? He said, no, 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 no. We, you see, spending some time on Robben Island gave me an opportunity to mature intellectually. And so my memory is very sharp. I remember you, you know, in the drums. Oh, okay. But uh, even then, you could see that we are talking to somebody who's big in stature, but very humble, very magnanimous. Um, when Steve Vigo met him in East London, when Steve came from Mtata, they had their own chat, and Steve said, those of you, I will uh, translate it for you. You see, I'm chanting the Bonnery no You know, after having shaken Tata um, Sumuko's hand, he said, I'm chanting the Bonnery no In other words, today, I have indeed met God himself. Now, that, that was the Sumuko. Um, not very pompous, but very humble, always. He married Mama Veronica Subukri. Now, the names given to her children symbolize and explain Subukri's philosophy, which um, my fellow senior counsel touched on. The firstborn is Melissa. Now I will come to Mandela's daughter's name, but uh, you listen to this first. Melissa, meaning deepening the spirit of Azania. That's number one. Number two was Dinile Sizwe, the sacrifice of the nation. In other words, even as early as when he married uh, Unosango, the customary name given to Mama Veronica was Nosango. Nosango means a gateway to freedom. And then of course, Dinile Sizwe was followed by twins, Itali Yebo, wealth creation, and Dedani Sizwe, nations way. In other words, after we shall have attained our freedom, and after we shall have created wealth for the Africans, nations, foreign nations, give way so that we can govern ourselves. Now remember what um, Kwame Nkrumah said. Kwame Nkrumah once said, seek ye first 
political freedom and the rest shall follow. Now what that means is unfortunately what is not happening today. When Kwame Nkrumah said, seek ye first political freedom and the rest shall follow. He meant, and, and that is why senior council touched on this, that with political freedom, there comes land ownership. Yes. Let us get freedom first and then we, the land should be returned to the rightful owners. That is very important. And also something that uh, Jola touched on about um, Sobukwe's um, prognosis. Medically, it is said that he died of pro prostate cancer. Well, that's the medical um, information according to the, the doctors. But it is a fact. You know, I was saying to um, Ogo and to those here that um, I, I wrote a book about Mama Veronica Sobukwe. In about a few days' time, those will get a copy so that it can be in the library. And by the way, it is the first book written by an African male by one of the political stalwarts, which is a woman. And uh, we are, clap your hands, man. <laughs> trying to explain in that book is the journey traveled by Mama Subukwe. And, and, and sometimes we spend most of our time writing about the Mandelas of this world, etc., etc. And we, we forget about the English saying that behind every man stands a supportive woman. And we also... And maybe we also need to change that and say behind every successful woman stands a supportive man. I'm saying this deliberately because if we were to walk a step further and say behind every successful woman stands a supportive man, we would not be having the gender-based violence which we have today. You know, Jola has touched on um, the, the legal um, the practice of Sobukwe, and I, I, I'm not going to go into that. But I want you to locate um, Sobukwe's understanding and philosophy against the backdrop of what Jola said. Uh, I mean, he touched on the Bill of Rights and uh, the law of one man having been made by the um, um, apartheid regime. But what was very unfortunate was each time before Mama Veronica was given permission to see the husband, she would go to Robben Island on the understanding that this day I am going to come back with my husband, only to be told upon arrival that no, 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 um, unfortunately, you can't see him and we are not going to release him. How painful that was. Now we're dealing with a system which, quote unquote, said that it is a Christian uh, system based on Christianity. But how dare can you incarcerate such a man uh, in perpetuity under the guise of promoting Christian governments? It is not. Now, you have, and of course they have their own church, the Arsterste, what do you call it? And, here, and here, whatever it is. And, and this is the foundation of her folkism, which is not right. Now, let, let us just move on and say Sobukwe and uh, Mama Veronica could have chosen the life of opulence because Sobukwe was a graduate, he was a teacher, a lecturer, um, and ultimately a lawyer. Uh, as we rightly say. And what I like about Jola's submission is that each time people write about Sobukwe, they write about him as politician, maybe, and no one, he's the first, to have zoomed in in Sobukwe, the lawyer. And I think he deserves a round of applause. 
Yes, see, I, I, I come from that background which says you must always give credit to where it is due. Something that pulls us down as Africans is the PhD syndrome. You know, if, if, if I see a fellow black going up, I immediately establish a small group, a small group which says, how can we pull Jack down? We must really pull him down. You know, at these new meetings, he talks so much, and we must really find something. Even if we don't have something, we say, create something. And now, that, that's a PhD syndrome, and which is not right. And, uh, and I'm not saying you must not talk, talk the truth, because we are going to follow it. Now, I said Sobukwe could have chosen the life of opulence, the life of um, what is going on today. But he said, no, his philosophy was to serve, sacrifice, and suffer. Because remember, Sobukwe was a teacher, and Mama Veronica was a nurse. And uh, so, yes, I mean, if you looking at the 19. 60 Chabin um, massacre. What worries me the most right now is that the name Chabin Day has been taken away, and that therefore fails to recognize what happened in Chabin. Now we're calling it um, what is this new name? Human Rights Day. Human Rights Day. I mean, how on earth? Thank you very much, uh, my son. How on earth can you call it a human rights day when human rights were violated on that particular day? It, it, it can't be. I mean, it's like the 16th of December. It's now called um, reconciliation. reconciliation. How can you call it reconciliation? It was called Dingan's Day, which was quite appropriate. And now it stands me that our present government agrees you know, to, to these names, it is just not on. And also, looking at where we come from, when we were students at Forte, we used to shout loud and high, one Azania, one nation. One nation, one Azania. I mean, right now, the name of this street is Dikorte. Maybe he was famous for having done something, but is the court relevant today? No. You drive around, you see a street named uh, H. Fervut. When Fervut was responsible for the brutality of men's inhumanity to men, you drive around um, the Val, Van der Bale Park, you see a street named B.J. Foster, and you begin to say, what's happening with our country? Why is it? That even the name, or remember I said Kwame Nkrumah said, seek ye first political freedom, and the rest shall follow. South Africa should really be saying, seek ye first the name change of the country, and the rest will follow. If we can only really honestly say, what well, Azania, this country is Azania. It is not just a geographical location. Where is it? Where is it? South, South, of, South Africa. of Africa. It does not make sense. And the rest is shall follow. And uh, so, yes. And the Sokukwe believed in the United States of Africa. He has mentioned that. If for even the currency that we boast about, the rand and whatever else, it's very weak. Why can't we have a currency which is similar to the dollar, United States of um, Africa. That's why they killed Gaddafi, because Gaddafi was doing well. Every citizen in Libya has some decency. And, and that is what Jonah spoke about, what Sobukwe stood for. One of the two um, speeches of Sobukwe which I admire the most, one, in 1949, at Forte, he was the president of the SRC, and he delivered a speech where he, inter said, I plead with you 
fellow Africans that we shall go down in history upon getting a new dawn for Africa and Africa for Africans. That was a good speech. Now, the other speech was when he baptized the Pan-Africanist Congress in 1959, where he said, come, join us under this tree, the tree of liberation and the tree of freedom. Now, that reminds me, two minutes now, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> now, the, 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 that reminds me of what uh, Noah of the Bible said. Uh, he said to his fellow countrymen, can't you see that the clouds are gathering? Come, join me in the ark. Now, that was the message that Sobukwe was conveying, that the clouds are gathering. Come, join the Pan-Africanist Congress. Now, some people have got a tendency of saying, no, actually, the PAC broke away from the ANC. Let, let me correct this. The ANC broke away from the PAC. Because, because the PAC stood by the resolutions of 1949 conference, where the issue of the land was at the top of the agenda. Now, when the Freedom Charter came into being, which then said, no, the land belongs to all this and that. The PAC said, we shall remain the Pan-Africanists. And in order to remain the Pan-Africanists, we shall identify and confirm our existence in 1959. I think let me pause there. and as much as the state sought to dehumanize him, eat away at his humanity, the silencing of the women in these stories are often mm. absolute. Mm. So thank you so much for that. So, uh, thank you. Um, I would also just like to make two comments before we open for questions. I think very importantly, what you managed to show in the presentation that you gave, uh, Comrade Mega, is that they has, there was a complete like as while we see the apartheid state as something very large looming over us and this big bureaucratic system, it also participated in the minutia in the every single day activities of destroying and punishing people and eating away at their lives in very petty, small ways, but that had a huge impact on people's psychology, on their well-being, and just steadily eating away at the spirit of a human being. And that was so complete, whether it's denying someone health care or actually not even allowing them to feel love, to have love in their life. So it's just absolutely shocking how it continuously did that to people. But also very importantly, I think, and um, Comrade Gordon touched on it, is that we often have to see <coughs> African people as political actors. And we don't get to see the intellectual side of that political action. Mm -hmm. And it's often represented just as, oh, well, it was political action, as if it's something spontaneous, mm -hmm. as if the intellectual work that goes into political action is devoid from African political leaders. And so that work of affirming the intellectual lives mm -hmm. of Africans is incredibly important. Not just African leaders, African women, the everyday people, the stuff that communities the working class produced, that intellectual work is very important. And that's always overseen, even with someone like Kwame Nkrumah, where it's seen as, well, he led a country. But the fact that he had three masters, two PhDs, all this work is not recognized. The intellectual work he did behind understanding Pan-Africanism, behind developing it and enriching it, as Sobukwe did, that work is often not affirmed. And that is because it's intentionally done to create an intellectual world where certain people think yeah. and other people just act. Yeah. And that continues today all the time. 
That is why we have certain people who are brought in to solve problems who cannot actually solve problems by our state. Because this understanding is that we can't think for ourselves. We have to give the problem over to someone else. And that, we have to stop that. And we have to affirm that. So thank you for this work. On that note, I'd like to open up for questions. Um, uh, we've already, I've already had indication that it should not be very lots of questions. <laughs> so I think we might fail with that because the hands are waving. Uh, there's one here and then there on the step as well. Two, four. One, two, three, and four. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure whether I should start by introducing myself or it doesn't matter. But uh, my name is Paul Jam Zashe. And um, part of what I do, I'm the current uh, communications officer of what I would call Sobukwe's, the military wing that Sobukwe formed. But I will not go into details. Perhaps as I came here, as I was debating to myself as to whether one should come here or not, or whether the agenda continues. One would ask what agenda? I think in the SE's opening remarks, he actually touched into that as when he said now, he's, where there is this deliberate agenda of wanting to separate to Sohukwe from his organization. From your opening remarks, I even thought that perhaps, as you might not even mention his organization, Sohukwe's organization. Well, talking about the legality of, you know, the legal side of Sobuko, we respect that, that's why we're here. But now, there's this deliberate agenda, I'll say by the system, they almost did it successfully, if I'm not mistaken, with Ubiko. That of commercializing Ubiko, disassociating Ubiko from his organization and wanting to make and focusing on the family. This is, the, I mean, this deliberate marginalization of what I would call the, the revolutionary left. You, 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 I think, I'm, I'm not sure if that makes sense. But um, secondly, my question would be the role of lawyers. But before I get to the question, if you remember, I think as, as late as 2014, the perpetrators of Nazism were still being hunted down in, in Argentina. Two SS officers were, I mean, were arrested and taken to the Hague. But the question is, what's the role of lawyers in today's world, you know, in criminalizing apartheid? Mm. That was legalized in 1994. Mm. Remember now, it is not us that criminalized apartheid, but it was the United Nations. Yet we have the, you talked of the judges that sentenced so open. You talk of the, the entire system, they're still working. We still refer to their laws, you know, and what is that? I mean, those are the same people that imprisoned Sobu. So now we say now, what is the role of the lawyers in criminalizing apartheid? Perhaps we we'll let that we could just might do justice to Sobu. Lastly, um, as I said, let us avoid silencing Sobu. There is a deliberate attempt to silence Sobu. Usobu Kwe for a number of years, up until his grave was declared a heritage site a few years ago, every year his grave was being vandalized. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Could we have the question short because we have quite a long list already. Thank you. One, two, on the steps there, comrade Mulela. Thank you, comrade Mulela. Good evening. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, mine is not so much a question, but just a, a, a comment. And I think one needs to really point out at this, uh, especially because we're talking of the the, the, the relationship so Google and the law. And, and and there's a moment that I think is very significant, uh, which I pick up as, as an earlier time that so Google started talking to himself about the law. Uh, 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 Pogrun Pog uh, captures this moment very well, uh, and I'll read. I asked myself why they killed each other outside my house. And the answer was that my house was on the boundary between different tribal areas in Soweto. And I asked myself why my house was there. 
And the answer was that I was a tosser and my wife was Zulu. And so the government didn't know where to put us and they put us in between. And I find this to be very much of a significant moment because here he is by himself talking about how the law was already influencing his life, you know, and, 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 and it was a very significant moment. So, so by the time he, he later would really be on the face of the law and dealing with the law, he would have already have sat down and had a discussion with himself about the law. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Makati um, My question is, how do we tell history that goes beyond just identifying the big man, the individual leaders? How do we tell a history that includes leaders, but also um, ground struggles, grassroots struggles, especially struggles that have been excluded from the history? I mean, are, are these two extremely opposites, or is there a way we can do it together at the same time? Thank you. Oh. I want to thank the speakers. I think you, your input was so interesting, and I really appreciate the information, um, especially because on this day and at this time in South Africa, we really are starting to forget our heroes. We're starting to forget what apartheid was, what it did to us. Um, under the dispensation of the ANC government, uh, corruption has replaced apartheid as a crime against humanity. And I think that in itself is one of the biggest failures of the ANC government. Um, you, you spoke a lot, Prof, and I, I really loved your input, and of course, uh, advocate, but I was really moved by what you said, Prof, when you spoke about all of the concessions that we've made uh, since 1994, including, for example, the, the national anthem. We sing disdain. We stay, we stay in this stem. This stem was used against us as black people in the height of apartheid. And we sing this stem today and it's our national anthem. And we, we dismiss these things as if these things are not important. But they're very important about, in terms of our history, in terms of reminding ourselves of where we come from. As they say, if you fail, to learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. Mm. Uh, you know, I have a lot of admiration for Israel in the sense that, and only in this sense, in terms of going after those who were responsible for the Holocaust, hunting them down even when they're 85, 95, yes. and on their deathbed. Yes. But they find them, yes. they try them, yes. and those people go to jail. In the 30 years or so of so-called democracy in South Africa, there's only a handful of people who've been arrested for the great crime of humanity. We have not, uh, that's first of all. Second of all, we don't own the means of production. We don't own the economy. The economy today is in the hands of the minority. So I suppose, first of all, I, it's a general comment, but also I want to pose a question to you advocates, and, and please forgive me if you think it's an unfair question, but part of what propped up the apartheid system was the legal system. And where we are today in South Africa, I would argue that the legal system is a part of a structure of a capitalist system, which, in my view, is a weapon against the masses and the poor. Mm -hmm. We've got members of Abashal Basim Jondolo here, mm -hmm. who every day are victims of mass brutality by the state, where the state is abusing the law to strip them of their dignity, to strip them of their land to violate their rights every day. They are jailed without trial. They are jailed on frivolous charges. Their leaders are assassinated. So my question to you, advocate, as an SC, is do you believe that the law is objective and as a weapon can be used by us as a working class to advance our agenda? Thank you. Thank you. We'll give the comrades a chance to respond. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Let me start with uh, the first question. I will jump around because the advocate has got more um, senses than me. Um, commercialization of Beagle. I think that was the first question. Remember, 
in the present day um, environment, people like to make money at all costs. <laughs> now, if the Beagle family does not come out and say, hold it, you, you cannot commercialize the name of our father and the name of our husband and uncle. I think it is important perhaps for the Biko Foundation to stand up yes. and shout loud. Yes. Because if it does not, as the Biko Foundation, stand up. Like for instance, the Declare Foundation. <laughs> Remember Declare, um, when he had to apologize, Tienz Ilof, who was the Vice Chancellor of Potterstrom University. I mean, I know him, I know him. We were together in higher education. But um, I, I did not agree with his philosophy. But all I'm trying to say, Tienz was at the forefront of standing up for the Declared Foundation, rightly or wrongly. So what I'm saying is that the Steve Biko Foundation needs to stand up. And then of course, the role of lawyers, I think, um, that will uh, come in handy. Silencing of Sobukwe. I'm very happy about that question because that's exactly what we're talking about. You, you know, right now we have, um, and I see my daughter there. Can you rise, please, uh, tell her? Telela has made his, I'm sorry for digressing. She completed a PhD last year in Oxford, and at the same time, at the same time, this year she's completing a master's degree, LLM. You know, she, she well done, Kevin. Now, silence, silence, incidentally, we're talking about that, that up till now, we don't know where Sobukwe's voice is. I had a conversation with Benjamin Popperant as I was writing this book. And I said, Benji, just tell me. And, and, yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. And, and, and he said, no, remember, Sobukwe lived before the advent of uh, technology. So his voice you know, could not be recorded. I said, I don't agree. I, I don't agree with that. because." As early as 1950s and even 40s, you know, you have recordings of the Mandela's, of um, Albert Tutuli, etc. Even my own uncle, you know, was. So there is a deliberate attempt of silencing. I, I, I spoke to the president of the PAC, and I said to him, "Man, we really need to go all out and get Sobukwe's voice." What seems to be happening, though, is that, and, and I'm brutally honest, that until and unless even the present day government can say to us, look, we've got evidence. We have gone as far as A, B, C, D in search of Subukwe's voice. I will feel comfortable. But right now, there isn't, you know, um, such. Subukwe remains to be silent even after his death. So that, that, that's that. Um, the second one was a, a comment. Now, Steve, you say, how do I become a Steve Beagle? You know, look at your branch. I think there's a branch of Azabo. Um, remember, Usaso, and uh, subsequently changed its name to Azabo. It was Azaso, then Azabo. So I'm sure there is a branch of Azabo wherever you are. If there is no branch of Azabo, I'm sure there is a branch of the PAC. Because Azabo and the PAC have signed, you know, um, to work together. So make it a point, my brother, that um, you, you do that. <laughs> the relationship between Mandela and Sobukwe, very briefly, you know, these two comrades at different times studied at Hilta. Mandela before, and then Sobukwe followed. They studied at Forte. Mandela was kicked out, and Sobukwe came in. Even Sobukwe, you know, he was revolutionary. 1949, a student strike. That's when, by the way, he met Mama Veronica, because Mama Veronica was a nurse just across the river, Chumi, 
um, incidentally, this is where I met my wife also when I was at 40. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I, I used to say, I used to say, okay, what is, I used to serve at the Seth Mukitimi Methodist Seminary, initially as the deputy chairperson of council and subsequently as chairperson. Now, the seminary wanted to name their library there as Mandela Subukwe Library. Mm. I objected. I said, no, 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 you are distorting history. If you say Mandela Subukwe Library, generations to come will say, oh, Subukwe's name was Mandela. Yeah. Or, Mandela's name, the surname was Sokukwe. Uh, I said, no. If we are honest in, uh, by the way, they were both Methodists. Of course, Mandela was never a preacher. Sokukwe was a preacher. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a preacher, that's why I'm emphasizing that. <laughs> so I, I said, if you are serious in honoring the two, why can't we say Nelson Mandela and Robert Sokukwe Library? I think that, that, that's it. So that, 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 that was it. Um, I can't remember the, the third one, but um, I, I think it was more of a comment. Um, yeah, I, I think let me just stop there. What does the law say? And my learned colleague here, um, I, I'm paralegal, I'm, I'm not a legal guru. So over to you. <laughs> Job. What I, I try to do is to reconstruct his lives, build them from nowhere, really. Because now, I mean, apartheid was such a, a horrendous system. That the, you know, the idea of uh, destroying your culture, your heritage, and then destroying your memory. Like, you know, people just you know they just talk about the system. But I, I described it in my first book as a totalizing system. It was truly totalizing. So it, it uprooted, it took the bones. You know, like the grain, just get a tractor, they remove the bones, everything, no memory, nothing. They even take your name, you know, one 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 yes. And then give you a thing to say name as well in addition to that. And then say name of the poor. So 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 both the colonial system and the, and the apartheid system, these were, these were totalizing systems. They were about a fundamental reconstruction of what it meant to be human if you were from the African continent. So my job is, is at least I see my job as reconstructing these uh, destroyed lives. And then sometimes correcting the distortions themselves, you see, because there is a lot of people who have written about so great, but And then you pick up certain biases. I mean, of course, they've done a good job because at least they've left us with a bit of uh, record. Because one of our problems in this country is that we have no records. No records. Uh, in, in 2017, I tried to write a story of the Mandela Tambo law firm at, uh, at uh, Chancellor House to get the files they were working on. And to imagine what it must have been like to have Mandela stand in a courtroom, address a judge, represent a client. In other words, be normal, like a normal person, a normal lawyer. You know? Because part of the destruction has been this like, complete erasure. You cannot imagine Mandela other than, you know, Puma Silva, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so my job is to put a different understanding of Mandela or Tam. Or, and this is the function I'm also doing, even about Sobukwe. Yeah. I mean, if you were living in this country, it's a very strange thing. I mean, people now get like so, you know, divergent in their views, and then they become strident. You know, very, very strident. I follow Sobukwe, then someone else is strident, I follow Mandela. <laughs> but if you were living in this country in like 1944 or 1949, these were the same people. They were in the same meetings, discussing the same thing, trying to achieve the same liberation. You know, and then over time, I mean, like this diversion, is, you know. But but there was a point at which they were sitting together in the cell. I mean, when Sobukwe went to prison, they were sitting together with Mandela in the cell. They were knitting, like or sewing, like together, literally together. 
and, and, and knitting and sewing and exchanging <laughs> the items they were working on. You know, and then you, you just find us here like, no, 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 I'm staunch this, I'm staunch that. The, the, the real problem is that the struggle for African liberation is ultimately the same. We, you know, so we, 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 you are looking that side, I'm looking that side, but we are ultimately standing in the same place. So it's recognizing precisely, you know, the sameness of the struggle for African liberation, you know, and that it actually never matters from a European standpoint, whether you describe yourself as, as charterist or describe yourself as, as Africanist. It actually never matters. So what I've been trying to do has been this job of reconstruction of putting together these pieces and reconstructing the lives of people. And what I experience with it is apartheid functions functioned at two levels. There was grand apartheid and petty apartheid. Now you want to understand how the two ways intersect, the grand and the petty. In many respects, grand apartheid was like easy to deal with. You called a big meeting and you called a big strike. But petty apartheid was hard because it was the dehumanizing thing. It's when people spit on you. You know that they actually spit on someone, spit literally. I'm like, what on earth? These people are barbarians. You know? you know, they just walk in, they just kick you, slap you, like walk into their house, just beat you up. You know? And then there are no consequences to that. So the thing is that you've got to humanize your, your character, the people you are working with. You know? so, I end up liking them because I'm working on their story and I sort of know that, okay, this is now June 1963. He's <laughs> like he's sitting at home and then he's meeting this girlfriend and he's trying to you know, make his way through it. So I end up liking them because you're trying to put yourself in their shoes. And most of our writings, we don't like our characters. We don't actually do a job filled with passion and love you know, trying to build the stories. I accept what you're saying, and there's a lady here who was saying, well, you know, is there a difference between reconstructing the big man and looking at the masses, and maybe the big woman? I mean, I went on the story, I picked up the name of Tezrafino from the Sobukwe archives, I went to follow the story. But it's a full, fascinating story, how she becomes uh, an attorney in 1969, how she then gets struck from the role in 1978, and then the conspiracy between the law society, as well as the uh, um, her own partner, Godfrey Pitcher. Pitcher decides, I'm going to save myself, and I'm going to sacrifice you, etc. So, so, but again, I followed the story, got the archives now, and I mean, I gave the talk at the uh, University of Vienna in 2019, the story of uh, the first African female attendant, Desiree uh, Mamsi female. She's still alive, she's like 98. It's the most remarkable thing. So the point is that we have to reconstruct the work. We've got to do the hard job. We've got to go and sit in the archives for hours and hours and hours. And then try and find the pieces, build the story, build the person. Find out who are they, what did they do? What did they like, what did they think, what are their ideas? You know, so, and so that's the work I've been trying to do on, uh, on Sobukwe and, and, and Sobukwe's work in law, and that's what put me into Tsobukwa's overall intersection with the legal uh, uh, system. I mean, this little gentleman there, I absolutely love what you said, you know, I was literally taking notes as you were speaking, that we have to look back, and I mean, you were mentioning in the portion from Benjamin Pokrin's book, it's absolutely, I think you are on point. I mean, I think we can even look earlier you can look at Hilltop, you know, um, because you know what happens after. Uh, Sobukwe has no money uh, to pay for his fees at Hilltop, no money. Uh, uh, and then no money also to pay at Forte uh, either. But a, a white family pays for it. And there's a long letter, it's because there's a book published, uh, a centenary, or bicentenary, I can't remember, of Hilltop. And there's a, a three-page letter where Sobukwe is responding to why he has disappointed his white benefactors. Because they're very disappointed in him. And then he explains that you just could never understand. Because I had to take your money. 
but I did not have to take your values. But 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 you see, so 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 I think your point is that you can you can stretch it even further. That his intellectual awareness of the space he was occupied is absolutely mind blowing. It's truly mind blowing, you know, because some of had a big brain, like massive brain, you know, and which is why he's in prison. He actually did an economics degree at the London School of Economics. Finished it two years. So when Scotia is a linguist, he's, but he's, he's an economist, he also breathes through the, 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 the law exams. Many of us are linguists, yeah. economists, and law. I could never do that. I'm happy at being a, being a lawyer. So anyway, I come back to this theme that let's, let's reconstruct black lives. Let's take them seriously. Let's do the hard work of getting these stories. Uh, this is what we're going to leave our children with. I mean, it's crazy in this country that the books we have do not have black heroes. And it's just mad. We don't have black heroes, but <laughs> what on earth is happening? I just don't understand. You know, uh, I, I gave a talk at St. John's, and this is a real story in 2018, after I had published uh, The Ladies' House. I called there, gave a talk to the, I think it was the Matric Boys, if I'm not mistaken. So I spoke specifically about one incident because the way I try to think about this, I think about one incident, but I have to look and do justice, give the detail of that incident, like what happened step by step. You know. So I spoke of the known house of Katie Killen, 1866, 1857, Eastern Cape. Ultimately, it fizzled out in 1858. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Reconstructed from the Grandson Journal, the Kafrarian uh, forts, and the King William Sound Journal. All of the stories of that, what happened to step by step. So we finished the talk, and one of the boys stands up and he says, You know, I want to thank you, sir. I call you, sir. I want to thank you, sir, because you know our history class, sir, it starts with Nelson Mandela, sir. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> so, um, look, I mean, I, I think the work about you know improving the legal system uh, uh, must continue. I mean, I, I, I'm not a defender of the uh, legal system, but I work with it. You know, try to find the space there to improve uh, the condition of the client. Um, if you can, <laughs> most of the time where you can't, but I, I mean, sort of, uh, yeah. Um, so there is a room for skepticism, but the fact is that this is the system we have. And uh, I think the struggle to destroy the system and build a new system, I mean, I, and you can do that, I'll support you, but, <laughs> but I'm, until the, you've won that struggle to destroy the legal system and build a new system, which is a true revolutionary struggle. There are no revolutionaries willing to do this, guys. There are just no revolutionaries at all yeah. willing to do this. So, so those of us who are there, who do not have the revolution, I mean, admittedly, I mean, so himself was actually very ambivalent, you know, when they asked him about violence. Because Boko was formed and so he was in prison. And they asked him about violence. He was asked by uh, Pogrom, you know, what do you think about violence? You know, he says, he says, Benji, you know, I'm a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the starting point is that you know I'm a Christian. You know, uh, and I have my ambivalences about uh, the utility, the futility, the gains, the losses. I am not going to take children and put them in the forefront there. Because I'm a Christian. I, I respect life. You know, it's, uh, only my time ago, you know, you did the, the, the thing. I was doing some research on how did the spirit of human rights lived through in exile, despite the conditions of war, through the Geneva Convention. I came across a speech that's by Oliver Tambu when he was justifying the uh, participation of MK in Wanki. No, it was not Wanki, it was the Angolan one. Yes, it was the Angolan one. So, uh, to, uh, yes, 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 because they were fighting alongside the Chubans. Yes, yes, yes. So he's justifying why 
South African children who are in, in, in Angola should be involved in the war, which is a foreign war. Like, I mean, someone calls it a bastard war. So why should our children get involved in a bastard war? And then he says, well, for the liberation of South Africa, we have to bleed a little. Yeah. It's a very painful thing when you actually think about it. That we take those children, because they were really children. Look at all of these kids who left after Sharpe 1960 and after Soil to now. They were like 17 and 18. That's a complete waste of human talent. I mean, apartheid was like such a bad system, yeah. but like an immoral system. Yep. So now, this is where this thing is unfortunate. This is our job to try and make sense of a destroyed livelihood of a nation. Your own families are destroyed, your own family like at home. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, everyone is just like mad, you know? And it's now your job to try and make sense of this thing and try, okay, well, how do we actually put a foundation for a better future? So that's the task that we have, right? But yes, I agree, let's fight the government, let's get involved in protests, let's use the legal mechanisms, etc., etc. But there is a lot of work that has to be done on the reconstruction of the African mentality. Like our job, like, you know, let's build the system from, you know, bottom up. <laughs> So I came across those, I mean, okay, one day I'll publish it. I promise you, this is my last one. I promise you I'll finally publish this book I've been working on. So he's, a, he's an impossibly challenging figure. But there's a line I came across. It's a report from a medical doctor you know, who says, look, I, I have examined so I think there's something wrong with him mentally. So I, the doctor says, the white doctor, I've looked at him. I think, you know, I think there's something wrong with him mentally. And then you look at, 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 at Zodo. Zodo says, look, these, these, these people are poisoning my husband. You look at someone else, look, he should, he's being poisoned. And they say, but it is true that this kind of petty apartheid can really make you go mad. You know? <laughs> so so then that's the lives we have to like, reconstruct, you know, put them on paper, try to put in the emotion, you know, like live the moment. So I'm afraid I've left you with more questions than answers. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, regarding you want to just say one thing? Yes, yeah. I, I think I need to respond to Mutazi. Uh, I did uh, injustice to her question. Yeah. Yeah. She asked about struggle in history. How do we put this together? Because it would appear that our history does not really uh, explain you know, exactly the struggle. Now, let me put it back to you and say somebody, I can't remember who um, senior counsel said, if you want to hide information from a black man, put it in writing. Yes. Um, and that is right. So a challenge is for us to read and read and write. I was, I was, I was, I was taken aback, you know, when I was in Aronoff, I met one lady, maybe about 18, 19, not older than 21, um, in a printing shop, etc. So I said to her, do you know Robert Subukwe? That no, I don't know him. <laughs> Have you ever heard of him? No. Do you know Nelson Mandela? Oh yes, we read about Nelson Mandela. I, I know him very well. <laughs> so th that is the distortion that is going on, and it requires us, you, the generation, younger generation, to unearth and unfathom, you know, these things which have been hidden for a long time. And the last one about corruption has replaced apartheid. That's very true. But um, it does not really help us to shout Amanda, Amanda, and complain and not do anything. Yep. I would feel quite comfortable if we were to collectively write a letter to the president and say, Mr. President, as responsible citizens of this country, this is where we are, and we think we can correct A, B, C, and D. We feel whether he will do something about it or not, at least we shall have been vindicated. Thank you so much, comrades. Uh, we're going to close now. Because I'm afraid of the time. Uh, however, we'll have a thank you note from the General Secretary of NUSA, Ivan Amanda, it's relate.
Comrades, thank you is thank you. Enkos is enkos. But I think I would fail not to take note that what sustained jail and further detention of the leader Sobukwe by the apartheid regime was at the back of Communism Act. But also if you look, the ANC had to be banned later. If you go to 50 fighting years, it is communists who were banned first. And it's been so strange for me that um, for, for having a world-class view of the world, Today, the people of Cuba, the people of Venezuela, have done anything to any, they have not done anything to anyone. Mm. The Battle of Quito Quanaval, that uh, advocate is reminding us about, Cuba took home dead bodies in their hearts and minds of being conquered in pursuit of the struggle for international solidarity. And, and they, today they had to pay a heavy price. And we, we're sitting here, we are in a crisis because the liberation vision that PAC, Azapo pursued, the liberation vision that the ANC pursued, has not changed the quality of life of our people. And I think that in these sessions that are going to continue to be here forged, we must be able to break ranks around common agenda. And that common agenda is a revolutionary agenda. And, 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 and that, that revolutionary agenda is about affirming all of us, affirming all of us as people into ownership and control of the economy. Yes. Because if we own the economy, if we control the economy, one of the things we are capable of doing with Sobo Gwedaifu, which was to fight for non-racialism, is to change power relations in society. You will not be looking at the color of my skin, if we got equal access to the economy, if the land were to be accessible to all of us, we could even advise each other and say, let's get rid of laziness and complacency. Mm -hmm. Give us structures, give us seeds, let's plow the land. You know, we want to get out of a township which was designed to be an inferior infrastructure to keep us there as blacks and Africans. We need to smash it. There's enough land. I mean, if you drive, I was, I, this weekend, I drove from Mossel Bay to Cape Town. Hectares and hectares of land. And yet we are packed like sardines in our township. We have no jobs. We can't work. We're not part of this economy. So we need a revolutionary agenda. We need to unite behind that revolutionary agenda. We need to continue to demand that education as an attitude of mind and a way of life, we must conquer it. We must be part of knowledge and knowledge production. We must emulate so where he comes from jail, he go and study, he becomes, he opens the practice. And we, we should be no young, there should be no young person who's not going to be educated here. And we don't have to have money for us to say the truth. You don't need to look around to say this thing is right, this thing is wrong, and we will put our bodies to make sure that it is achieved. So I'm just saying, I don't know, he says a prophet, a preacher. I just want to say thank you for coming. But you know, sometimes the preachers, they sing, <laughs> So, 
so we, we're not sure, comrades, uh, what will release your energies um, to, to not just to appreciate that I went to forge, but to begin to say, how do we organize the working class as a class with self? How do we make sure that the intellectual, the educated, as far as we go to no, 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 if you're young, go to school, go and study. If you need money, let's find money. Doesn't matter where it comes. You must, you must go and conquer that education. Mm. But we must still build a revolutionary agenda. We must Aye. still build formations of the working class Aye. that are not going to be corrupted. We can't be defeated by this corruption. Aye. By the way, we should say, capitalism is, is inherently a corrupt system. Yes. It breeds corruption. Yes. That's why we believe firmly that the future is not capitalism. Capitalism has failed to address problems that confront humanity. Mm. The future is socialism. Yes. These days, it's hard. Mm. In fact, ketile, ketile. Mm. If they know that when we call manis, ah! <laughs> no, 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 you know, in the United States, the empire, as we speak, both the Republicans and Democrats, they, they signed a pact that uh, there will be no colonies will be allowed in the United States of America. As we speak, there is a war. There's a war which is presented as a war of the United of, of, of what of Russia and Ukraine. When in fact it is a proxy war uh, between NATO and Russia, but driven by the Empire. We should be clear to say, end the war. Because any war is fought by the hands of the working class. It is the blood of the working class that gets spilled. We should be clear to say, drop sanctions against Zimbabwe. And then tell us nonsense that Zimbabwe are back in South Africa. What must, what must they do? They, they have got sanctions, Iran has got sanctions. People of Cuba, Venezuela cannot choose their own path because of sanctions. If you, are, if you are democratic as imperialist, why don't you allow people to choose their own part of liberation? That was my thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, comrade. Yes. Um, thank you, comrade, so much. Uh, I'm sorry we had to end quickly. It was such a fantastic night. And uh, thank you, Comrade Tembega, for really infusing history with such humanity. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, travel safe, comrades. Bye.